to seeing God's people working shoulder to shoulder back in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, we now get to chapter 4, where the work continues, but we see opposition coming towards that work. One of the key things that we'll see in this passage is that our God will fight for us as we labor for Him and for His glory. Now, as always, I encourage you just to take some time to read this passage for yourself, just to familiarize yourself with what's happening in the story. We see Nehemiah throughout this book leading on his knees. He is a man of prayer, prayerfully dependent on God, and it's a, an example that we must follow. So spend some time just praying, asking God to help you to understand his word so that you'll be prepared to teach this to others. I'm going to just show you some of what I've noticed in this passage. One of the things that really helps us in narrative like this is to look for the structure. And one of the tools that's worth looking for is the, the narrative plot arc where you've got your setting, some sort of conflict that's building. You're looking for your point, the point of climax in the story. And then from there, you see how the story resolves before we get a new setting. Now, in this story, as I was looking through the details, trying to work out the structure, I was trying to make a, a decision. Is the point of climax uh, here in verse 14 and 15, or is it here at the end of verse 20? Um, and I made the, the call, I think the climactic point is seen over here. Our God will fight for us. So I put that uh, for verse 20b as the point of climax where we see our God will fight for us. The setting uh, is all the people working shoulder to shoulder um, on this work. So that is what we see in chapter 3. And then the conflict then is from 4 verse 1 all the way to 20a. So the majority of the story we see the conflict building and I'll show you in a moment how we see the enemies of God's people working against them, trying to frustrate their plans, but God's people continuing with the work. As I said, I think the climactic moment is this, our God will fight for us, which is a recurring theme we see uh, in the Old Testament story. And then from there, uh, the story resolves itself from verse 21 to verse 23. As we see the people continue the work uh, with uh, the readiness to fight if necessary. And then our new setting comes in chapter 5, verse 1, where we see a new internal challenge to the building project, which is raised with Nehemiah. So, as I saw it, that narrative plot arc just helps us to see how our God will fight for us. We are laboring for a God who fights for us. That's what um, I called this section, Laboring for a God Who Fights for Us. And I'll just, some of the key details, if we look at characters in the story, it's another um, useful tool to use looking at the different characters. And we see Sanballat, um, his associates, and the army of Samaria. So just when you, you see that, we've, we've met Sanballat already, um, we've met Tobiah already, but now they've got the army of Samaria with them, so things are escalating pretty fast. Um, so all the enemies, uh, Tobiah, who is at his side, so they are, they are shoulder to shoulder, trying to work against God's people who are working shoulder to shoulder. And then by verse 7, we've got Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Aram Aramites, Ammonites, sorry, the people of Ashdod. And if you were to mark these on a map, you'll see that the enemies are, are coming from every side, north, south, east, west. Uh, God's people are surrounded. The situation is looking pretty bleak. We see in verse 10, with all of this opposition, the people are, are feeling discouraged. Their energy is, is giving up and the enemies are trying to capitalize on this. We also are told of the Jews who live near them that is, who live near the enemies. So these are actually Jews who, who are on the wrong side, and they're coming in and trying to discourage the people. But the last time we hear of the enemies is here in verse 15, where we're told that God, 
frustrated their plans. And that's a key thing that we, we see. We see Nehemiah showing again a prayerful dependence, um, which we've seen him show from chapter one of the book. And again, we see they prayed to our God and then they acted responsibly by posting a God. Nehemiah rallies the troops by saying, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And then in verse 15, as we see, we hear the last of the enemies for now, because God had frustrated their plot against God's people. And then that climactic moment, as I called it, our God will fight for us. And that's what we see in this chapter. We see God fighting for his people because his people are building his city, which is the place that bears his name. So all of this work that is happening in Nehemiah, the, them laboring side by side in chapter 3, it's all for God, for his name and fame, so that he will be glorified, that his glory would be made known in the world. And the enemies of God's people don't want to see that happen. We see the repetition of the fact that they are rebuilding the wall. Tobiah saying, well, this wall they are building, even if a fox goes up on that wall, uh, it, they'll break, the fox will break down this wall. Um, but we see that they continued to build till this wall reaches half its height. The enemies are trying to put an end to the work of building. And so we see uh, this work is mentioned a number of times and those who are doing the work. Other key characters are the people. So this is the Jews in Jerusalem who are doing the work. And we see not only do they end up doing the work, but they also get stationed along the wall um, protecting the work. So they, they're not only building now, they are holding spears and shields and bows and armor. And so not only are they holding the tools they need to build the wall, but they also have swords and spears and bows. Spears, shields, bows and armor. And obviously in this book, the other key character leading the way is Nehemiah himself. He tells us a number of details of what he does as he hears all the problems. Um, and he really is leading by example. Um, he and his men, we also see that, that repetition. And he includes himself alongside the people where he says he's leading the way by praying to their God. A few other characters are singled out among the people we see. Uh, the nobles and the officials. Now in chapter 5, sadly, we'll see um, that those nobles and officials actually caused a bit of an internal problem. So not only were there enemies from outside, in chapter 5 we'll see enemies from within the community. And Nehemiah has to deal with that problem. But in this chapter, they are laboring together for a God who fights for them. And some of the key things that we see them doing in this chapter, we see them praying, we see this call to remember, and then this is pretty much a call to trust. And these are themes we've seen in Nehemiah so far. He is a man leading the work on his knees in prayer. He is remembering God. We saw that in his prayer in chapter 1, and he rallied the troops by calling them to remember the Lord and to trust in him. And we've seen them do that shoulder to shoulder in chapter 3. And now in the face of this opposition, they are called to pray, to remember, and to trust God who is fighting for them. Now we might read a prayer like this and think, wow, that's pretty harsh, saying turn their insults back on them. Don't cover up their guilt or blot out their sins. But the reason for this prayer is not ultimately that Nehemiah wants revenge, but rather he wants God to be honored. He wants God's name held high. And in these enemies opposing the builders, they're opposing God's people who are doing God's work for God's glory. So they're actually opposing God himself. 
And prayers like this are something that we see often in the Psalms. Uh, for example, in Psalm uh, 69, verse 27 and 28. We see it in Psalm 79 and Psalm 109. Among other Psalms, we see prayers like this. Uh, wanting God's name to be honored, so they pray against the enemies who are, are profaning the name of God. We also see that Nehemiah is a man who, who knows God's word intimately. And here where he says, don't be afraid of them. Remember, this phrase, don't be afraid, is also seen at a number of times in, in God's word. Uh, we see it in Exodus 14. We see it in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Uh, we see it in Joshua chapter 1. And those are all times where we're told, uh, Exodus 14, the, the Egyptians are chasing the Israelites and they're stuck between this army and the Red Sea. And Nehemiah says, don't be afraid. And then he tells his people, remember the Lord. Um, the same God who rescued the people in Moses' day, and the same God who rescued the people in Joshua's day, uh, he's with us. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. He's great and awesome. And fight. So something we see here is pray and act. Pray and act. Build the wall. Here we see remember and act. And this really is one of those rallying calls. Don't be afraid and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. You can almost picture him rallying the troops, leading by example, and then trust that God will fight for us. God will fight for us is also an Old Testament idea. Again, we see it in Exodus 14 verse 14 and in Deuteronomy 1 verse 30. The same God who, who rescued his people from the Egyptians, the same God who uh, enabled his people, Deuteronomy, is just before they go and overtake the land of Canaan. He's the God who fought for them back then, and he would fight for them today. So Nehemiah had every reason to be confident as he prayed, as he remembered, as he trusted, and as that prayer, remembrance, and trust caused him to act, they continued to work. So we see, after they pray, they rebuild. After they remember, they fight. After they trust, they continue, or as they pray, remember, and trust, they continue with this work. And it really is an incredible thing seeing that they are laboring for a God who is fighting for them. And for us, this side of history, we know with absolute confidence that our God will fight for us. Because many years later, outside of these walls that they were building, our Lord Jesus fought the ultimate battle against sin and death and the devil as he fought for us. And so as we remember the gospel, we pray the gospel, we remember the gospel, we trust in the gospel, knowing that God has fought for us in Jesus. And for example, you can go to Ephesians 6 verse 10 onwards where we're told that our battle is ultimately against the spiritual forces that are at work, but they are forces who have been defeated when Jesus fought for us on the cross, and we now fight with the gospel, the readiness of the gospel, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 6. We fight as we pray the gospel and remember the gospel and trust in the gospel, knowing that our God will fight for us, and so we continue laboring for this God as we build for his glory. We're not building physical walls, we're building his church and there's greater work for us to do. And we can do that work with great confidence because our God will fight for us as we work for him and for his glory. So as you dig into this chapter further, I pray that it will stir your own heart to continue with this work, knowing that God will fight for you as we are building for his glory in the world. So let's be a people who pray, who remember and trust as we build for God's glory. Well, God bless as you dig in further.